today's guests, President and CEO of United Way of Greater Philadelphia and Southern New Jersey, Bill Goldera. Since becoming appointed or being appointed as CEO in 2018, Bill has been a crucial part of United Way's impact. His passion for fighting poverty and expanding opportunities has helped thousands of people in the region. In addition to his role with United Way, Bill, or an ordained minister, is a senior pastor at Arch Street Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. He's also the founder of Broad Street Ministry, a nonprofit organization providing an array of social services for the neighborhoods in Philadelphia. Bill has also been amongst Philadelphia Magazine's 100 Most Influential Philadelphians. Bill, welcome to Here for Good. Dennis, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. So, Bill, you know, prior to joining United Way, you were already a, a change maker in the community through your involvement with the Presbyterian Church, through your nonprofit endeavors. I would think it's safe to say your passion for helping others has clearly been a part of you for a long time. But what was the spark that led you down this path? Uh, Dennis, I think it's two, two experiences and one was a painful experience and one was a was a was a really uplifting experience. And I'll well, be we, very we better start with the painful one so we can get that one out the way. Get that one out of the way. So my first experience was um, one of exclusion. And it's not that it's not that in this time that we're in, there's big E exclusion, historic exclusion, and there's like a a, a high school boys exclusion trying to figure out what it means to be a young man. And I had uh, been really interested and kind of talked myself into trying out for uh, a select singing group where all my friends were involved, my closest buddies. And you know that's that age where you're part of a, a, a tribe that travels together. And, and my best friend told me, you know, this is actually only, not only for better singers than you, but those of us who've been at this school since we were in kindergarten. So it's called, it's for the lifers. That's what they call it. people who are together from kindergarten. And I wasn't, I was a scholarship kid. And so I was told in no uncertain terms, you don't belong. And I remember what that felt like and how little I appreciated that. And the music director at the time said, you know, Bill, I, I see in you an ability to take a disappointing status quo and build something that is alternative. And so he's like, if you want to, I will help you create, the school's big enough to have two groups. And because I'm both um, stubborn, a bit of a builder and very competitive, I'm like, yeah, we're gonna make a different group and we're gonna make a better group. And so, so taking the, so Pain it of fueled you as opposed to stifling you. Yeah, I was like, I need us to take this feeling of being kind of put to the side and figure out if we could build something else that would be even better. And that's the group. My sons go to that school as well. And that is the group that endured and the other one died. So that was an experience where I, early on I was like, maybe I can not just build something, but invite others to help build something new. But Dennis, on the personal side, you know, I just came up uh, being grasped, and I don't want to get into the deep water here, but there's something about the story of scripture that for me paints a picture of a world that I want to live in, where people give sacrificially, and they invest themselves deeply in loving their neighbor. And I was not a religious kid, particularly, but the stories, and it wasn't about the words or the laws or the doctrine that really got me, like I'm not a rule follower, as you and I both know, but there was something about these actors in scripture who are like performance artists. And the stories were about throwing big dinner parties and welcoming everyone in. And those who are most often excluded are the ones who have the place of honor. I 
took that stuff literally and to heart because I was like, that would be a world worth living in where, you know, those who are up or down and those who are down have a chance to claim a seat of honor. And so I've tried to mash up a, a, a spiritual lens through the work I do and combine that with a desire to build up rather than tear down. But you know, Bill, with with so many distractions in the world today and it's an ever-changing world and when you look at the challenges of our economy, I think it takes a special kind of leader to inspire people to take action. You know, I mean, clearly you, as you mentioned, you were driven internally um, to do the things that you're now doing. Was there a defining moment in your career that helped you to, I, I would say, understand how to best reach out and activate others? I mean, clearly you're very, you're, you're active and you've been activated, but what about the task of, of inspiring and activating others? So I think Dennis, you and I have talked about this kind of thing before, you know, there's a point at which you know, ideas are really cheap and in the marketplace. And I didn't really understand that until I got to a place where at some point in your journey, if you want to do something, anything different or bigger than what's currently happening, you have to figure out how, uh, what would drive someone to join you with their, with their network, with their interest. And, you know, it's never been easier to invest yourself in something, right? There's a plethora of things. So this has to differentiate itself. So I remember in the case that was defining for me, I was a very young man and it was the first time that I'd ever asked someone to make a very large financial investment in something I was doing. And I was scared and I've never done that before. And I was freaked out and I didn't know the person that well. And so I sat down with this gentleman who I'm still very close to today. And I, and I said to him, I laid out my idea and I wanted his advice, and, but I really wanted his investment. And I said to him, I remember asking him this question, how do you, we, I know that you're a person who's very generous, but how do you make decisions as to what you're gonna get behind and what you're not? And he said, Bill, it's two questions and it's two bars that you have to clear. The first bar is pretty low, is Bill, is what you are suggesting I do worth doing? Well, and he said, Bill, there's a lot in this world that needs fixing, addressing, attending to. So if you say something that, you know, sparks my attention and I'm persuaded that that's worth doing, then I've, you've cleared the first bar. But as I said, Bill, that's low. Mm -hmm. Then the higher bar is, am I persuaded by the way you talk and what I have learned about you? Are you capable of doing what you say? Meaning there's a high bar of execution. And I remember freaking out because I was like, I don't know if I could do what I'm saying I could do. But I remember hearing, that was the first time I heard from someone who is invited often because of their social position to be supportive. And I'd never heard the criteria by which they make decisions. And it's both, and I've tried to share that with younger people and peers. Yes, this is a good idea. Can we deliver? Is you know, really a hot bar. That, that you makes know? it sound like he was he was someone that was more interested in investing as opposed to donating. So he wasn't clearly thinking about just making a donation to whatever it was you were working on, but it was an investment, one that he wanted to know that there would be a return on that investment. And does that that and makes Dennis, sense. It does, and it's also like you and what that does to the person who is asking, it kind of puts the burden back on you, burden, but joyful burden. I need to deliver for this person who is placing faith, right? If you go on TV, people are inviting you to buy all kinds of things that are going to bring you joy or satisfaction and delight. But this is, and that's a transaction. This is an interpersonal investment, as you say, and I better if I want to keep this relationship, I need to keep my end, right? And it's not a transaction, it's a 
it's a relationship. So, so that is a great segue into something else I want to talk to you about, the promise. You know, the promise, this multi-year initiative to, to raise funds and invest in the city of Philadelphia and bring over 100,000 Philadelphians above the poverty line by 2025. I mean, that is a bold and aggressive goal. I mean, not only, I think, is this a tremendous goal with the opportunity to impact over 100,000 lives, but the structure of the initiative, the, the collaboration amongst the uh, business community, private philanthropy, you know, the nonprofit sector, and government, just to bring this group together, I think, is remarkable. So tell me a little bit about what sparked that idea and how did you get it up to where it is today. Well, Dennis, it's, um, you know, I think everybody in the world believes in collaboration, right? Everybody, if you said, are you a collaborative leader? Or are you a, a collaborative person? You know, it's sort of like when people say, are you a good driver? You know, most people think they're a better driver than they are. And most people think they're more collaborative than they are. You know, like, so let me tell you, like all the way back, like when you're talking about human suffering, um, I I believe there's layers and steps that I try to go to, and it's and you're tackling head on the barriers to involvement and investment and alignment. The first one is there is a leadership style in Philadelphia that was really troubling to me when it is relates to big problems we're trying to tackle. And it is a, if you read the paper closely, you'll see this sentiment everywhere, which is somebody else should be doing something else about this issue. Somebody else somewhere else should be doing something else, which is literally abdication of responsibility, right? If I see, and so I think it starts with a personal conviction about that my neighbor's suffering is my responsibility. Right. So for me, that comes back to and I'm sorry to bring this into the into the podcast, but I remember one of the old stories of Scripture. Someone went to Jesus and said, how do I inherit eternal life? And he, his answer is there once was a man who fell among thieves. That is the weirdest answer. But it basically is a guy who got beat up and fell in a ditch. Right. And so his suffering is related to your eternal destiny, right? So for me, that's my answer. But Philadelphia, for instance, has fully, it's the hot, highest poverty rate of any city in the country. So how viable, if your motivation is not spiritual, what if it's very economic? Is it is a city that has fully 25% or a fourth of its people languishing without access to the American dream, is that a viable city? So it starts with uncovering each corner's motivation. Who stands to benefit from an investment in something different than what we're doing now? And why would they care about this, among other things? The second big issue is a lot, there's an unbelievable amount of fragmentation. There's good intentions behind philanthropy, but there's not always a vision for what kind of impact we could have and each of us wants to control the impact that we have in our social good. Where for me, the larger impact is to align interests so that you can align a bigger pie of capital so you can have a bigger impact. So how do you align the interests of a mayor who might want to take credit for the program or, an, or a private sector investor who's like, I want to get my name out there we have the issue of how community organizations are treated. They're like, well, if this thing comes forward, does that threaten what I'm already working on, right? We, we treat nonprofit organizations like the Hunger Games, right? Like if you get something that I don't get that, and so how do you break through that? And then on the last thing, there's what I call the individual philanthropy. You know, they just wanna know something's gonna work, right? And so for me, it's, uh, our mutual friend uh, once said that the promise is a four year overnight success. It is a meaning it took. I mean, it is FaceTime. 
It is white to the eyes, understanding what it is that people want to achieve well, but first. Bill, this, this, this challenge, this problem is not unique to Philadelphia. I mean, you probably can almost take a look at any major city in the U.S. and overlay, and you have the same problem. So what was it that was so unique that allowed this promise to come to be in Philadelphia? What was it so unique about partnering with the Greater Philadelphia United Way that allowed this to happen? So it was a, it starts with that universal grasp of the issue, understanding that if we could build an unprecedented coalition, that would likely have a bigger impact. And then the next thing is defining what are the things we can tackle on our own that we don't need permission or the government or someone else to do. It's no waiting. We could do this now and it would make a real impact. It will require more money than we probably want to spend. It will take more of your time than you probably have and attention. But we need to make an, a sacrificial investment so that our neighbors can experience flourishing. Okay, so we so, started. So you've, you've been doing this now for a little over a year. Is there anything that you can point to that you would consider to be a, a success at this point? So the, yeah. So the, the, the year one impact report comes out tomorrow, Dennis, and I'll send you a copy. But the number one thing we focused on was the low hanging fruit, which is there are benefits, whatever in this divided time in our country, whatever your political persuasion, we all invest some amount of money from our tax dollars to a social safety net. The problem is for many of our most vulnerable Philadelphians, they do not get access to the full amount of benefits for which they are eligible, which creates stability in a household, right? If you can get the full SNAP benefit, which is a food subsidy, you can invest those dollars in groceries so then you can pay for more childcare so you can go to work. It's a, it's a cycle, it's very practical and it's very intricate. But Philadelphia County alone left $450 million cash in the bank that didn't reach people's pockets. So the science says every dollar you invest in pulling those dollars down, a collaborative effort to pull those dollars out of Harrisburg, the state capital, Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia, there is a 10 to 1 return on investment if you do it right. Once you there's diminishing returns after you get, pull everything down, but if you just do that in year one, in year one we're going to report tomorrow officially that there has been a nine to one return for Philadelphians. We've been able to pull down over, I think the exact number is 175 million dollars in cash into people's uh, pockets for a $5 million investment over one year. So if you, if, if I could tell you, I'm gonna give you a nine to run, one return on your investment, would that interest you? And it's oh, really happened. It's really, so one of the things that happens with any social program is people wanna know, does any of this work? Is anyone actually helped, right? And cause we've all been burned before. And this one, I'm gonna be proud to tell, we're having a, a gathering of all the partners, the community partners, the investors, the civic leaders, the mayor, to say, we got this one right, let's keep going because we have wind at our back now. And I think it has implications for other markets, the way we've built this coalition. It's so, exciting. Yeah, it is exciting and that's great success. You know, you talked about social programs and, and we know that many social programs get their start or they're actually sustained based on the generosity uh, you know, wonderful people out there, philanthropists that feel the the need to invest in things that will make a change. You know, United Way being one of the world's oldest and longest running charitable organizations. And when I look at the Greater Philadelphia United Way, which was recently the recipient of yet again a very generous donation by Mackenzie Scott, who has, she has really done a lot in terms of addressing some of the humanitarian crisis that we're, we're faced with these days. Tell me a little bit about her 
uh, decision to invest in the work of the United Way and how those funds are being used? So it's one of those things that you just, I mean, part of being in this part of the world, I think Philadelphians, there's something in the water where you're um, skeptical. Like, I think that's one of our spiritual gifts. We're skeptical people. And so when I got an email from a person that I don't know, say, I just want to tell you this process story for a minute, Dennis. Like, it's someone saying, I represent uh, an investor, and I'm wondering if you'd like to talk to me. I'm like, I don't know you. I don't know who you're talking about. That could have very easily been a no. Like, I, so it's one of the things where I... I tend to take calls from people I don't know. Like, I'm glad I'm open. So there may be, for folks who are paying attention to this, doors open in weird ways, you know. So I took that call and I made an appointment. And and what happened was, is that we started on a bit of a, I was part of a diligence process that I wasn't aware of, which was Mackenzie Scott's representatives were, to set, were saying to me, in, in our discussion, if you had an outsized investment in your current trajectory, can you help us understand what that would mean for your organization and your community over a next period of time? And so I I took a chance and, and worked with uh, my board chair to put forward a proposal to that would start with a very important founding principle, that if this person was to invest their resources in a united way, that the gift was not united way. It is not for us. It is not for our institution. We were to be a catalyst. And what I tried to share to Mackenzie Scott, what I would like that gift to do is inspire and catalyze local investment. If you think we're on the right track from your seat nationally, that you think we're worthy of investment and back to that question of, and can execute against our promises, would you consider investing in us so that I could use those dollars to inspire people locally to invest in our problems? So rather than take the money and advance programs that I'm doing, how could we use those dollars as a catalyst? And so the board approved, uh, which I'm so grateful for, a four-year plan that is across our geographic footprint to basically bring forward aligned initiatives that bring lots of partners together that would never work together otherwise if it weren't for an infusion of capital so that we could create much bigger impact together than we would on our own. And our only um, re receipt of those dollars is to do the essential work of coordination, orchestration, measurement, and accountability on delivering impact. And we don't do the work. We don't, you know, we don't take credit for the work. We try to inspire others to be invested in a new way of doing impact work in communities. And it's been powerful because we, we were in a position to receive that gift, which in a way we probably wouldn't have been before. Yeah, you know, Bill, you, you talk about inspiring others to invest. There are some of us that have been around for quite some time and, and recognize the history of United Way and some of the good things that United Way has done over many, many years. There are some of us also that have um, recollection of some of the challenges that United Way has had in the past as a global organization. How do you talk to people about restoring the confidence that the work that the United Way is doing and is charged to do will be done. That the dollars will, like you say, the dollars aren't coming to United Way for United Way. It's coming to support the programs and services that the United Way helps to connect people with. So how do you address that, that issue? So I think that with whatever people, if this is an individual or an organization or a business, I believe deeply, and I drive myself crazy with this, but I read the comments section of the paper. I read criticism, right? I take it seriously and I take it to heart. And if you read the top five things that anybody says about United Way, they ask how much of this dollar goes to feeding you, like your overhead, your bureaucracy. And I was like, well, we could come up with a marketing campaign for that 
or we could actually address it structurally. So I'll just give you some statistics. From 2013 to 2017, that's the five years before I arrived in the, in the office, when we did not hit a revenue target, we cut community support 44%, and we cut our own budget 1%. In the five years since I've been here, we have increased community support 47%, and cut our own overhead while upgrading our talent pool, we've cut our own pockets 52%. So what I'm gonna be able to say in one year's time, maybe two, is if you want to invest in solutions that are collective solutions that impact thousands of people, if you invest in one of our initiatives, you will have a very strong leadership research function that will help you understand what impact is being made. You will join the leaders in your community who are sacrificially investing together in this outcome. And most importantly, like our peers in other organizations who play this role in New York, not United Ways, Robin Hood in New York, Tipping Point in the Bay Area, 100 cents of your dollar goes to the cause. That is because the board of directors uh, supported at this United Way. I feel like if we've got the biggest challenges in our community, we need to be the first United Way in the country to operate on 100 cents because nothing else will do. And people say, well, how did you do that? Well, we're standing on the shoulders of a, a century of supporters who've created a bit of an endowment. We've got a very generous donor base that wants to invest in us being able to deliver on that promise. They want the leaders of United Way who are staffed to stay there. So I've said, listen, let's build a business model where I can say to a person who works in a company who's got their own bills, their own family who might need support. If I'm asking you for support, the least I can do is say, a hundred cents of your intended investment goes to your neighbor, not to me, you know, or my salary. You know, and, and that's important. If I look, unfortunately, I believe we're going to be talking about COVID-19 for a long time. You know, and, and even as the pandemic becomes more manageable from a, a health perspective, I think the impact it has had on our communities and, and the existing problems that were exacerbated because of, this, uh, of the pandemic is going to be with us for a while. So I, I guess to that end, what has it been like to make changes for people or to help make changes for people with already challenging circumstances mm -hmm. you know, during and post pandemic? Because we saw those that were vulnerable became even more vulnerable. And so the role that United Way can play going forward, you know, with those investments, with the commitments to, a uh, hundred percent of each dollar being being used. Uh, do you see that as a challenge that you feel the greater Philadelphia United Way is going to be able to make an impact on? Well, and Dennis, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't. They are no stranger to this. Some parts of our society, sectors of our society, were ground to a halt. And some places, maybe like Virtua, went into absolute overdrive, right? So you saw a tale of two realities. But one thing that was incredibly unifying in that moment was you couldn't avoid the impacts of this. There's something about um, everyday struggles that most of our neighbors encounter who are trying to overcome uh, the barriers to flourishing. That is invisible. Uh, it is uh, tucked away, and there's uh, many people who have an ability to live their lives without being aware of the disparity, the suffering, and the struggle. COVID focused our attention, and I would never welcome that ever. It was a horrendous moment. But I feel like there was a sense for once, and we are not a unified uh, nation or community, and yet in that moment, the only fruit that came out of that for me was people were paying attention to how 
they were being impacted and therefore how others were being impacted. So I feel like in some ways we're still able to retain the attention span of those who are in a position to positively impact the suffering of their neighbor. Because we haven't moved on, as you said, the, the follow on impacts from our behavioral, our mental health, our, our economic health, our physical health, we are nowhere near past any of that. And in some ways that is helpful in making appeals to stay the course in helping people be invested in a better society. Because if some are just flourishing and everything's going great and some are feeling left behind, those who are flourishing have a hard time being focused on the struggles sometimes. That's been my experience. You know, and uh, clergy played a huge part in helping a, a nation that was challenged throughout COVID. Um, did you see a lot of people sort of depart from, say, organized worship and religion during COVID, are, are people coming back now in terms of um, supporting the church, gathering at the church, you know, still relying on clergy for emotional and, you know, religious support? Are you seeing a return? So what I found, this is my personal journey, you know, and, I, and, and Dennis, you, know, you and so many others helped stand up, right, the COVID relief fund, right, which was like a crowning achievement, but it was really hard to do. And I was trying to figure out church while that was going on. And I'd never done that before. And I came up a certain way. And, you know, the 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 leaders were saying, Bill, we need this more than ever. We are terrified. And I remember on, a, on our final Sunday, when it was becoming clear this was going to be a thing, you know, I shared a message about, you know, be when you are thinking about reaching for that toilet paper, ask how that impacts your faith. Because you taking more toilet paper is like a spiritual issue. Do you remember that when people were just going into the store and that that wasn't about toilet paper. That's about our spiritual condition, the fear that I'm going to put myself first. Like that was a thing. So one of the elders said to me, Bill, you need to put this, I'm going to challenge you to put this in, elect in electronic form, and I want you to do a meditation for people on the mailing list, and then we're going to share it with anybody who needs a one-minute, med and I, you can already tell, I can talk, Dennis. So me, the discipline <laughs> of one, one, one... One minute is not in your vocabulary, Bill. I've known like, for a long minute. time. And, but he uh, was like, you need to do a one-minute devotion every day for us. And I was like, and how do you distribute that? I didn't know anything about it. And many of my clergy colleagues were similarly, we got, we would took time to learn from each other. How do we address the fear, address the discouragement, the despair, the loss, the sadness, the, the, the uncertainty of, are we ever going to come out of this? Remember we, back in the day, we're like, well, this is going to be six, seven weeks and we'll be on I mean, it never it was so scary. And so for me, church became more or not church, but the the elements of understanding that there's a bigger picture became more important. And my my own ministry and my sense of feeling supported by others grew during this period because I felt like I wasn't focused on what I'm trying to do. You know, we all make idols of things that we're working on. That's the most important thing. And instead, I really had an opportunity to gather my own thoughts, if you can believe it, Dennis, in a one minute devotional, <laughs> seven days a week. So instead of a 30 minute sermon once a week, it was seven minutes over seven days, which is a much better thing. So anyway, I, I was what I did and so many others who were in that place had to learn how to meet that moment yeah. in a different way. Well, I'm going to challenge you on this one minute narrative that you just just mentioned. And so I often ask those individuals that grace me with their presence on, on, on this. What would and I'll, I'll, I'll 
put the question to you as well. What would an 18-year-old Bill think about the person you are today? That's 20 seconds I, of your one minute. That, yeah, I'm going to eat it so. all up. <laughs> the, thing, the thing that I'm proudest of in everything I've ever attempted is I, I am loath to give up. I'm a stubborn, if stubbornness was a spiritual virtue, I would be next to, you know, at the right hand. Like I'd be, because it. I just believe that whether it's sports, singing, or social change, tenacity is the name of the game. And for me, I didn't know that that's what I needed to learn how to major in as an 18 year old. I was told to cultivate all kinds of things, but I feel like there should be a course offered somewhere in high school about cultivating the, the discipline of tenacity because there's lots of reasons to give up. I'll tell you that, yeah. I'll tell you that. Well, Bill, I, I have to tell you, we, we've covered a number of topics today, you know, starting with the promise, starting with what really sparked you down this path of supporting and serving others, you know, how your spirituality sort of finds its way into the work you're doing in the city of, of Philadelphia and what you're helping uh, those of us in South Jersey to do. This has been a, a real pleasure, a real joy. I always enjoy my conversations with you. I enjoy the work that we're trying to do together. I, I, I just want to thank you for um, joining me on Here for Good. This, this is a platform to talk to individuals that are inspiring others to do good, those individuals that are doing good themselves. And so I, I just want to thank you for, for joining me and sharing with me your thoughts and really the work that you are doing for those that sometimes can't do for themselves. So thank you for joining me on, on Here for Good. Uh, Dennis, listen, any time I can spend with a leader who has distinguished themselves as both clear-eyed, focused, determined, and selfless, it's my gift to be around you. So thank you for, for inviting me and uh, I hope you stay encouraged and everybody who's listening in is, is manages to cultivate some, some encouragement. Bill, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dennis. Take care.